All right. I'm not hearing James, but welcome to the Carolina Weather Group. We'll go ahead and get started tonight. Um, James was going to lead it off, and, and he's working hard at keeping us live on all of our other feeds, Facebook and Periscope. So we'll get started tonight. It is Wednesday, May the 23rd, and tonight's topic is going to be on the physics of lightning. We have Dr. Eric Bruning from Texas Tech University here with us tonight. I'm going to let Ashley introduce him in just a little bit, but first, we're going to kind of go around the region and introduce uh, Eric over in Memphis, Tennessee, and we have Ashley in Texas, and uh, we'll kind of talk about our regions, and I'll finish it up with a a briefing on the southeast region and also we're watching the tropics tonight uh, in the next several days as we have an area of disturbance over the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico uh, trying to work its way northward towards the Gulf Coast and we'll get to that in just a little bit but first let's go to Eric Brosius over in Memphis Tennessee and Eric what do you have going on weather wise in your neck of the woods hey good evening Shay and everyone else uh, it has uh, as, as I mentioned a week or two ago when we hit May we hit summer and I uh, just checked the stats for uh, so far this month and we've had exactly one day that has been had an average temperature below normal and that was by one degree uh, if May ended today we'd be fifth warmest on record we can't seem to get rid of the upper 80s and 90 degrees uh, and I'm sure Shay will allude to it with the uh, tropical brief but there's very little steering flow as well and we've had scattered thunderstorms around and they are not moving, so we're getting pockets of flash flooding uh, the last several days. Uh, I, for instance, got uh, 1.6 inches in about 40 minutes Sunday afternoon, along with uh, some hail and microburst wind. So uh, it definitely feels like summertime when you're underneath one of those uh, torrential downpours. But uh, not everybody is getting it. It's just kind of uh, scattered hit and miss, but we're, we're definitely into the summer regime already here in the Mid-South. All right. Yep. We're um, we're definitely feeling the heat here as well in the southeast. And, and uh, how about over in Texas, Ashley, what's going on in your neck of the woods? Yeah. So you, as you guys already know, I've been all over the country this month. I came from Norman, was in San Antonio last week. So I haven't had a ton of time to be looking at weather data, but I do know that it's going to get hot and dry, typical Texas weather. Nothing really on the radar for the next week. And we're looking at pushing a hundreds later this week or even next week. So that's going to be fun. Um, this past weekend, I had to deal with a spin up tornado that moved right through my jurisdiction that we really didn't expect and nobody really did. So I guess I could really use some of that dry weather. So. Yeah, I was just going to ask about the, the tornado situation. So how, how was that on emergency management when all of a sudden everybody had to go right to work immediately without any warning? Uh, it was absolutely awful because I pulled up the radar that morning and we just had some general thunderstorms. Like it wasn't anything, just some rain showers, some lightning. I was mostly just concerned with some house fires because usually we have a lot of uh, lightning hitting structures, causing structure fires. And then my weather radio goes off and it says tornado warning. And I was like, oh, what? And I pulled up the radar and surprisingly enough, the simplest thunderstorm spun up, had the hook and everything. And uh, I guess it was on the ground for about five miles. It was an EF1. Um, it did some damage on some roofs. And I think it was on the ground actually 10 minutes before they got the warning on it. So the people who got hit didn't get a warning. So it kind of freaked me out because usually I'm very weather savvy and I know what's going on and I keep up with everything, but it just wasn't expected. So I had to really spring into action and then I also had to decide whether or not I needed to take shelter or not because my town was in the warning technically. So I was like, well, where is this thing? So it was very interesting because I'm usually never caught off by, by weather just because of my background and by keeping up with it. Right. Yeah. Sometimes those things have a way of creeping up on, on many of us, even here in the Southeast. Sometimes we'll get something really odd, like a little short wave action off the ocean. And it just causes enough convection in the atmosphere. That's, that nothing catches in the models prior to it. And then next thing you know, you have thermals mixing with this uh, very strange short wave. And then all of a sudden you get this blow up of convection and some rotation and whoa, what happened? Yeah. So totally understand that. Yeah. Um, and I, I was just going to add, it didn't help that it was 830 in the morning on a Sunday. <laughs> so I don't think very many people were really ready for that. So. Right. Well, at least you got kind of a practice run. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, ho hopefully you won't have any more of those anytime soon and, and you have gained a little bit of experience from from that uh, event. Mm -hmm. So that's always good. 
Uh, how about James? I'm not sure if James is able to talk right now. He's on mute. If you can't, just give me I'm, a... I'm, I'm here very briefly. I don't know if you can hear the crying baby even in the background, but that's why I keep disappearing on you. <laughs> I was just going to ask about your uh, update over in, in the Charlotte area. Yeah, let me give a brief look at the forecast. Uh, just, you know, a few passing uh, showers. We had a nice rumble of thunder that actually parked over us here in South Charlotte, but across the two-state region right now, we do have some strong thunderstorms in part. Nothing severe, no warnings at the moment uh, as we're taking a look at our Carolina Weather Group radar. I was just taking a look at some of our camera shade to see if I could catch any storms uh, on our camera network. Uh, no uh, rain showing up, but a nice little sunset here at Wake Forest University outside Winston-Salem. So I uh, wanted to pop that up and uh, send it back down to you in Charleston. All right. Thank you very much for that, James. Much appreciated. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, talk a little bit about the southeast region. And uh, well, hold on. That's not the one I want to share. Let me try this one more time. Let me know when you can see this. Good to go. Okay. So yeah, a little bit of radar. You can see uh, this this sort. Of, there's an undulating front or a meandering front that is drooped across North Carolina and the Virginia border. Uh, this has been pretty problematic and pesky up in that area for the last several days. So finally, it's it's making a move to the south through the Outer Banks right now, and uh, it's shifting up the wind directions. But pretty moderate winds up that way. Uh, where some of this evening jetting or nocturnal jetting is starting to crank up ahead of this front. Uh, down around the south, the Bermuda High has been the dominant feature. And so we're seeing some storms flare up along the, the sea breeze front inland in uh, some of these areas. And we have some more moisture moving into the area. And, and really what it's all about is this Bermuda High um, out here over the Atlantic Ocean. And so what we end up with is a southerly flow that comes up into the southeast region, which has been keeping this moisture profile over us for several days since our um, storming, our Gulf moisture surged up last weekend and it just hasn't left. And now we're watching the tropics. And what we have is an area of disturbance that has built up over in the Western or Northwestern Caribbean Sea. It's just off the Yucatan Peninsula. It looked like it was right over on the imagery earlier and it might be, but the National Hurricane Center is now giving this area a 10% chance the next 48 hours and 70% chance the next five days they feel that it is likely that it will develop into either a subtropical storm or a tropical storm uh, before possibly making landfall along the Gulf Coast, maybe near Louisiana, anywhere from between Louisiana and Florida. So this, this area right here, you shouldn't really pay attention to the direct line down the middle. And we always have to leave some room for error in margin of error in the modeling and the guidance for where the system may go. So don't, um, pinpoint this storm to make landfall in any one of these spots. We have to be very patient and wait to see once it's over waters and develops to get a better idea. This is what it looked like earlier, very disorganized still. We see uh, an area of rotation over the Yucatan Peninsula. The area is just off the coast, actually, underneath all of this convection. And we do see a lot of convection flaring up around what's trying to gather an organized center of low pressure at the surface, except there's a lot of upper shear going on right now. And you can see those cloud tops blowing from west to east. It's limiting vertical stacking and not allowing any of this deeper convection to aggregate around the core. And plus being over land, it's not gonna be able to organize. So once it moves to the north over the warmer waters of the Gulf of Mexico, then we should see a little bit more progressive development, but it's not gonna be uh, any time the next day or so, 10% very low. Uh, very slow, gradual development of this system. We're just gonna watch it day to day. It looks like the timeline's backed up even further, maybe even Sunday instead of Friday, what it was a couple of days ago. Uh, we were looking at a Memorial Day washout. But the main thing with this system is the rain. And I'm going to share screen one more time because I forgot to put this up. The primary threat for this system is going to be rain. And actually, I need to go back and uh, hit the quantitative precipitation forecast up because I deleted that off the, the menu. But there you go. So this is the primary threat is heavy rains. And a lot of these areas along Florida and up along the Gulf Coast and even parts of Georgia into Atlanta have had quite a bit of rain, oversaturation for some areas. And so here we go with another four to seven inches of rain uh, piling up on top of that. And we're talking some, some significant flooding. And it also looks like the system, once it does come onto land at some point, we think it will come onto land. It may not move for several more days after that. So this looks like it could be a prolonged rainmaker with a train of moisture just surging up into the southeast region, mostly on the eastern side of the system. Looks like the western side might be a little bit drier. Uh, so, you know, we'll just have to kind of wait and see what happens. Uh, be patient. Uh, no reason to panic or anything. If you're on the Gulf Coast, we just need to watch and see what the tropical 
outlook is for it. And uh, go with the guidance of NHC right now, 70% next five days. So that's what we're watching. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Ashley to introduce our guest for tonight, Dr. Eric Bruni. And he's going to give us um, presentation on lightning. Go ahead, Ashley. Yeah, so I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Bruning. I think it was 2011. He taught my very first atmospheric science class, the introduction one. And he was a great teacher, very enthusiastic. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, we definitely went over lightning, thunderstorms, tornadoes, you name it. Um, he's been at Texas Tech the whole time that I was there and, and much longer. And he specializes in lightning and has an extreme passion for coding and Python, which at the time I hated. But I'm so excited to have him on the show and introduce Dr. Eric Bruni. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Good to see you again, Ashley. Good to see you again. It's been a while, uh, yeah, not a, you, uh, a year or two. <laughs> you uh, you had occasion to work on some lightning data, actually, with all that, uh, that Python back in the day. And uh, it turns out that you remember the lightning mapping array that you used uh, back then. Uh, it turns out we've got some storms I can show you uh, coming in in real time on that tonight out in uh, eastern New Mexico. So That'll uh, be awesome. Great. Yeah. So kind of just kicking it off, we always like to ask our guests, um, what got you into weather? We all have our unique weather story. So what was yours? I was, uh, I would say I was probably fairly terrified of storms growing up. And uh, I, I think that uh, curiosity and wanting to understand it was a, a big part of it. Um, I also always really enjoyed, you know, maps and computers and found myself watching a lot of the weather channel towards the end of high school and realized like, you know, I think this could all kind of kind of fit together. And so that kind of kind of set me on the course. Cool. Uh, could you kind of give us a glimpse into where you got your schooling, colleges, what you studied? Yeah, I grew up in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, went down to uh, Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma in Norman for uh, undergraduate all the way through PhD and uh, finished that up in 2008 and then uh, spent uh, some time in the Washington DC area working with the geostationary lightning mapper uh, uh, for uh, for NOAA on, as part of their science team and then uh, moved into the faculty position here at Tech after that. Yeah, so were you always interested in studying lightning or was there kind of a moment during your academic career that you wanted to take that path? Yeah, that was uh, that was really a happy accident. Um, I, I heard about a job opening in group at the National Severe Storms Laboratory, uh, Dave Rust and Don McGorman, mm -hmm. and uh, they brought me on in the fall of my freshman year, and I got to degrease some motors for this instrument that we were going to fly into into thunderstorms to measure electric fields, and really got hooked on field research and observations, and um, where it was a it was a great group to work with, and uh, so just just stuck with that from there. Definitely. Um, another thing I forgot about, you've done a ton of field work. Uh, could you kind of explain some of the different projects you've done, uh, your role in it, and then maybe how technology has changed from the years of early field work to now? Yeah, I've been involved in, uh, like I mentioned, since my since early undergraduate all the way through graduate school, um, that research group flew uh, very large, like 20 foot long weather balloons and uh, tried to hit the updrafts of thunderstorms with those to measure the electric field. So a sort of modern day Ben Franklin trick. And, uh, and uh, that uh, first field campaign that I worked there was in uh, Northwest Kansas in Goodland. It was a field program called STEPS. And that was the first field program that documented that uh, with, with some certainty that there's thunderstorms that have an electrical structure that's uh, flipped over from what you would normally expect to see in a cloud. And so the, there was an instrument that was used in that field campaign called the Lightning Mapping Array, which I mentioned earlier. And that, uh, that instrument uh, was, uh, was used for the first time in that field program and has really opened our eyes to a lot of uh, things that are going on in, in the storm. And is, um, you know, instead of just seeing that single strike to ground that you might be familiar with on the, on the news, you're really uh, looking at how lightning fills the volume of the cloud. And so that allows us to relate things to the meteorology a whole lot better as well. Mm, definitely. Um, have you done any other field work? I thought that you have been doing that the past couple of years, right? Yeah, I had a, we, we ran a field program locally here as well. Um, we uh, installed our own lightning mapping array shortly after I got here and then um, got, uh, got some support from the National Science Foundation to uh, take the two Texas Tech CABE and mobile radars out into the field. 
and study how um, the, the turbulent motions in the clouds are organizing charge and thunderstorms. And so uh, that was a, a real storm chase type experience, um, except that we're, we were after um, really any kind of thunderstorm, even the, even the more boring ones. How sensitive was that lightning array, that, that mapper array? I know that uh, there's, been, there's been lots of arrays at ground level that pick up all kinds of feedback from different areas, power surges. I mean, you could have a transformer blow and it registers. I mean, um, tell us a little bit about that kind of instrumentation that was used prior to the, the new lightning mapper from Ghost per se. Right, yeah. Um, so the, you know, the, the original technology that was developed back uh, roughly around the 80s uh, was a, were the ground strike networks. And um, a lot of the, the lightning detection systems early on used, um, used spherics, uh, which are the, the sorts of things that you hear on AM radio when, the, when it crackles. Um, there's a, uh, that radio signal is, is picked up by a network of stations that are located in different places. And those are used to triangulate back to where the lightning happened. Um, so the easiest thing to detect is uh, is those first uh, what we did with those first networks, which was the ground strikes, because a lot of charges moved around in those, and so that makes a big signal. Um, and then as technology's gotten better and faster, we've gone to this uh, lightning mapping array, um, which is able to actually detect the the stepped leader processes in the cloud. So that's the actual the development of the branched channels themselves that the bigger current flows happen along. And so, um, that's what really opened opened up the sort of next frontier, and then that leads to the geostationary lightning mapper, which is uh, an optical sensor that actually looks for the flickering of light uh, from lightning from uh, geostationary orbit. Very cool. Um, so a couple months ago, we actually had the chance to interview Sam Berkseth. Yeah, who right. was one one of your students, and she's talking about uh, how she's been doing really cool weather and art stuff. And I wanted to ask you, because I'm pretty sure you got a grant to do a study on lightning or something with art. Could you explain that and the uniqueness of that project? Yeah, that's right. Um, that, that same grant that supported the, uh, the field work with the radars um, had an outreach component tied to it where we worked with an artist here at Texas Tech um, who uh, painted, um, so as a painter by training and painted uh, both lightning, uh, sort of abstract versions of lightning, as well as abstract versions of clouds with sort of different degrees of abstraction. So she had some things where you could tell it was like a supercell with a mattice, but sort of simplified and kind of captured the essence of it. And then that went all the way to like fully abstract stuff where it was more just sort of the, the experience of being there in the storm. Uh, so we had an exhibit here at Texas Tech uh, last fall that lasted about three months. Um, that was in uh, kind of took over a full gallery and we mixed the art together with the science in that. Um, Sam was a was a great person to have on board with that because her artistic inclination um, was was great in in helping prepare that exhibit and she could you know translate between the science and the the art really well. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, how did you guys come up with that idea? Well, I had a uh, I had a, a sort of wacky idea that with this, these lightning mapping arrays, you can see the shape of the channel. So I was thinking, well, maybe we could, uh, we could take these, these flashes and 3D print them and hang them in a gallery and, and sort of see how a, a supercell looks and, and, and how that lightning fills the volume of, of space. I kind of pitched that idea to the art department and no one really took me up on it. But uh, the, the chair at the time was, uh, was the person I wound up working with and we, uh, you know, she she met up with me and was like, I still want to hear what you kind of have in mind. And uh, we hit it off um, talking about, uh, you know, about the data I was working with, showed her some examples and uh, realized we had some common language about uh, texture and energy. And I realized that she might be able to capture some of those things that I have, uh, you know, scientists might have a, a harder time capturing usually. Well, I, th I think that's so important, especially when we were talking to Sam about the, the more we can take science and mold it with other topics, the more we can get at it out to the public and explain it and get people inspired or, or prepared to take that kind of information on. It really opens the door to different kinds of people to our field, which I think is really important, especially too when we're going to be doing outreach and things like that that involve safety. So I'm really excited. I hope to see more projects like that in the future that we can kind of use and, and channel, especially in my field, because one of my biggest issues is trying to find a way to get people excited about preparedness and safety, because a lot of times people are just like kind of not complacent, but it's not exciting to them. So 
I was really excited about the art thing. It's great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was a uh, it was a delight to work on something that um, yeah I, I think stretched both of us uh, professionally and also gave the public something that they could relate to that says like you know the things your eyes are seeing are the things that the scientists are responding to as well and uh, even though we have all this technical language to be careful about how we're talking about it. Um, you know, the, the things you're still seeing out there when you're looking at a storm are, are relevant uh, to all of us, no matter the level. Yeah, definitely. So now that we've kind of warmed you up a little bit with some of the basic research questions, we're going to go ahead and get into some of the things you're more specialized in. Could you give us kind of just a basic of how lightning works um, and the formation of it? And then we'll kind of go from there. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, I think I'll uh, share my screen at this point, and I've got some uh, some slides here that kind of walk through some of the basics of where charge comes from in storms and how that leads to lightning. Perfect. All right, let's go over here. You're good to go. We can see your All screen. Right. Great. So well, uh, we you know, we had it. We had it there. Hold on. It was there, and then it's not. Not there anymore. Try one more time. All righty. Let's go back over here. That working now? That's it. All right. Still visible? Oh, it was. <laughs> Not sure what. You're going. losing it when you go full screen. I think there. Okay, we'll just stay out of full screen then. Keep us yeah, going. I think that's that's when we lost it. All right. That's weird. That didn't happen earlier when you were trying it, but that's okay. We'll work with it. All right, no worries. Um, so, uh, you know, the, as uh, Ben Franklin showed us, you know, lightning's an, an electrical discharge. So that means we need electric charge up there in the storm. And uh, this figure kind of explains the basics of how we get a, a thunderstorm to be charged up. The electrification happens in the uh, in the uh, what's called the mixed phase region of the storm. The re range of temperatures between zero and minus forty degrees Celsius, where you can get ice and liquid water and water vapor all together at the same time. And so uh, the electrification happens by the collision of grapple, uh, which are ice pellets um, and uh, that are formed from super cold water that all freeze little droplets that freeze together. And uh, those collide with ice crystals. And uh, depending on the temperature level that they're at and the amount of uh, water vapor that's around uh, in, the, in the cloud, you will uh, get different polarities of charge. So I got a, I've got a picture on here on the screen of a uh, this mixed phased updraft, and um, that is uh, is uh, that that sort of that vertical motion. And you see in the lower part of the cloud here, we have uh, a mixture of grapple and ice crystals. The grapple charges positive, and the ice crystals charge negative. And so the grapple precipitates out because it's 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 large. The ice crystals are small, and they stay just sort of levitating there in the cloud. Um, and then above this polarity reversal temperature, about minus 15 degrees Celsius, um, the uh, the opposite charging happens, and then the grapple precipitate out, and they combine with the ice crystals from the lower level. And there's positive ice crystals that are left over in the upper part of the cloud. And so. That's how we get the what's called the basic tripolar structure of a thunderstorm. And uh, that's what, what drives all of the, the production of lightning. Um, how's that sitting with you so far? That's pretty good. For, for the viewers, I think there's folks that have always asked, what, is, what exactly is grapple? And, and we usually say that it's an aggregate of ice crystals that sort of form into small balls. And I, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, it's, it's an aggregate of... Uh, liquid water droplets that freeze instantly when they, they start collecting on a nucleus. And so, you know, some ice crystal gets lucky, it starts collecting those a little bit more and the bigger it gets, the faster it collects others. And it forms this little like Apollo capsule shaped thing. It's maybe uh, it's certainly no more than like an eighth of an inch across typically. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So once you have this, uh, this charge, if you, uh, yeah, if you if you took a physics class at some point, uh, you, you might remember that once you get charge, you get uh, uh, that that also creates an electric field between the charge regions, and so that that electric field is a, is a kind of force field, and that um, that electric field once it gets big enough, uh, once it reaches some threshold, 
uh, the air basically can't withstand that force anymore, and the electrons on the outside of the, the molecules in the air start getting torn apart by those electrical forces, and that's what starts the, the, the spark that leads to lightning. So uh, let me go to the next slide here. So once you have this basic charge structure that's formed in the cloud, then lightning flashes are going to start between, uh, between the two charge regions. So uh, on, the, on the left cloud here, uh, this is going to be an intra-cloud flash that starts between the upper positive and mid-level negative charge. And uh, the flash starts in the middle and proceeds both directions from there. So you have a channel that goes up into the positive charge and another channel that goes down into the negative charge. Uh, sometimes if there's a lot of excess negative charge, that's what leads uh, to your bolts from the blue that kind of come out the side of the cloud and strike ground at a, a distance. These cause a lot of the, the lightning deaths. Um, um, but they're also relatively rare. Most of the flashes in the upper part of the cloud just remain within the cloud. Um, and then the same thing can happen down in the lower part of the cloud. You can get a, a lower level um, intracloud discharge between those two lower charge regions. And a lot of times uh, that, that lower channel will uh, proceed all the way down to the ground and get rid of uh, excess negative charge in the cloud uh, that way. So. Um, you can go all the way then from the, the precipitation charging to the, the sort of basic lightning behavior and the different kinds of lightning flashes in a, in a you know, fairly, fairly straightforward way here. So let me um, ask a, a question right here where, where, uh, where we've gotten to this point. So most of the, um, most of the cloud to ground strikes that occur then um, are negative cloud to ground. So what, what changes from the cloud perspective that results in some of these much larger uh, positive CG type of strikes that we get. Right, so so what what has to happen there is, uh, this is gonna be mixed up because I can't show my, uh, my screen big, we'll just drag it around. Um, whoops. Oh. And that one. All right, now we can see it. Um, so what happens in, uh, in more complex uh, storms, uh, bigger storms, is that the, uh, the charge structure gets more complicated. So uh, in the upper left corner, for instance, here I have two vertical slices through, uh, through a supercell. And uh, you recognize the, the mesocyclone down here and the, uh, that same tripolar charge structure in the updraft. And then as you go towards, uh, this is the, towards the forward flank of this storm, um, the, the negative ice crystals remain aloft here. There's some additional uh, charge separation that happens off to the side of the updraft. And so in, in this case that we studied, you get the opposite polarity charge structure next to the updraft with positive above negative charge. So when a flash starts between these two charge regions here, um, that's going to be a positive channel going down into the negative charge, and that positive channel can then come to ground and make a positive ground strike. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, that's very cool. I actually, I remember looking at that diagram now. <laughs> I'm getting flashbacks. Yeah. Reading, yeah. <laughs> reading all those papers. Great. And then in the in the bottom figure here, this is a, a conceptual model of the charge structure in a mesoscale convective system. So a leading line of convection, and then a big trailing stratiform precipitation region. And uh, these big stratiform regions are what tend to make um, a lot of the, the really, really big positive CGs um, that uh, uh, are also frequently the ones that are going to cause sprites, um, which are uh, which we probably should talk about here a little bit, too. Yeah, definitely. I was going to say, um, I actually don't know hardly anything about sprites or any of those other uh, rarer lightning uh, phenomena. So if you could go into that and cover some of that and then tell the viewers, too, what is a Sprite? Because people are probably thinking it's what you drink out of a can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they're, they're zesty in their own way, I guess. But yeah. Um, yeah, let's see. I don't have a picture of a Sprite handy to pull up. Do, do any of you have one? I do. I'm going to pull it up right now for us. Yeah. Okay, so so there it is. That's a, that's a great example. Um, so that sprite that you see there is actually happening um, about 50, uh, 50 to 100 kilometers altitude in the, uh, 
in the atmosphere, way, way up above the top of the, th the thunderstorm. Um, so this picture was probably taken, um, uh, probably taken from a, a high altitude and at some distance from a storm that was happening, um, you know, maybe you know hundreds of miles away. And uh, what happened is that maybe there was that that one of those big positive ground strikes in the stratiform region of a of a squall line that moves a whole lot of charge around all at once. And uh, again, thinking back to your physics class, when you move a lot of charge around, it changes the electric field in response. Well, because there's uh, because the air is less dense as you go up in the uh, in the atmosphere, there's less. Uh, it, it takes less electrical force to cause that breakdown process to take place. So what a sprite basically is, is it's, it's a flash that's triggered in the ionosphere in response to a lot of charge being moved around uh, in, the, in the stratiform region of one of these, these clouds. We've seen it happen in response to a, a big anvil discharge in a supercell as well. So these happen in the flash of like a, a, a thousandth or a millionth of a second. These are very, very quick and very hard and very rare to catch on camera, correct? Do they happen rarely or are they pretty frequent and we just don't catch them? Well, it, they were they were a new discovery, I think in like 1989, um, but it's because they happen quick and no one thought to really spend a lot of time staring at that dark part of the sky beforehand, as we've gone to look for them more often and as we know more about what causes them, it turns out that they're probably easier to find than we uh, than we expected. I wouldn't be surprised, um, just my gut says, and I could probably go find some evidence to back this up, that uh, you know most of the big mesoscale convective systems are, are making at least a sprite or two. It's probably just as well, because if I saw something like that lingering in the sky for 10 seconds, I would think it, it's, you know, that aliens have come. Yeah. So, so our, uh, the next one I wanted to ask you about were the blue jets. Yeah. So this one, you can see it's a great picture you have up on the screen. Um, it shows that these blue jets, those uh, go upward uh, from the thundercloud. And so a blue jet is, a, is sort of a positive CG uh, to, the, to the ionosphere. It's a, a positive channel that's coming out the top of the cloud and uh, then makes a leap all the way up to uh, 100 kilometers altitude um, in the... Uh, to the connect to the ionosphere. Um, so it happens in rare circumstances when there's a lot of uh, excess positive charge in the cloud in the upper part that then needs to uh, needs to escape somewhere and it you know the storm can't quite deal with it any other way. So that interacts with the the plasma of the ionosphere, correct? Um, yeah, that's right. So the ionosphere is a plasma and it's that makes it conductive, um, just like the um, the ground, sur the surface of the Earth is also relatively conductive compared to the atmosphere, and so those are two places that you can dump a lot of charge to if you need to. To give it some perspective, I don't know if I can get a bigger picture of this. Let me see if I can find something a little bit larger. Here we go. Um, I don't want to use too much, but yeah. So we have a giant blue jet. We have halos, sprites. We have all kinds of new names popping up and, and this is starting to become more and more of a, of a science to be studied, correct? I mean, is there a lot of research going into this? Yeah, that's right. So when, and anytime a scientist encounters something that's uh, new and unexplained, uh, immediately a bunch of scientists get curious and hop on the project. So um, yeah, there's lots of, lots of effort going into this. Um, those uh, gigantic jets um, are, uh, are a good thing to pair up with the blue jet. The gigantic jets are negative uh, CGs to the ionosphere, or negative negative uh, bolts to the ionosphere instead of to the ground. Um, and uh, those, uh, so those are uh, same sort of explanation as for the blue jet, just a different polarity. So what that leads to the next question: What causes these? So it it's uh, it comes from there being an an excess of charge uh, in the cloud, and so. Um, a lot of times when there's an, an excess of charge in the cloud, that'll lead to a ground strike. Um, if you get a particularly favor, uh, th but there's certain situations where you get that excess charge configured in a way that um, the direction the channel steps doesn't come out the side of the cloud and towards the ground, but instead starts um, starts proceeding upward. And that's that has to do with the arrangement of the electrical forces in the cloud and um, you know how that how that then proceeds. So, are there are there any tie-ins to um, when when we're observing these types of the the jets and sprites to the severity of the storm itself, or or does it not necessarily indicate 
you know, that you're going to be getting surface based uh, severe weather out of it. No, these these I, I wouldn't think would be a, a very good indicator of uh, of surface severe weather. It, you know, some of them do happen with severe storms, but for instance, the red sprites coming out of the stratiform region of the mesoscale convective system, the condition is that it just needs to have a lot of charge, and uh, that might have been built up hours before, back when the storm previously was severe. So not of much use for uh, you know for a now casting kind of thing. Uh, for folks doing uh, like the Air Force or uh, you know uh, let's say NASA's flying something through. Uh, through the upper atmosphere, um, it's definitely of interest to them so they don't fly over one of these locations where uh, a discharge like that is likely to take place. I have another question. It's another type of lightning, but it's not as cool as a Sprite, I guess. But I used to buy those picture books when I was a, a little kid on weather because I loved weather, like in second grade. Uh -huh. And I had a lightning one and uh, they had a picture in it and talked about ball lightning. So I have, I'm actually not very, uh, what's the word? I don't know how that actually works. Do you know? And could you explain what ball lightning is and if you've ever seen it? No, that's, uh, that's one of the, the real mysteries in the, um, one of the real mysteries in, in the field right now, actually, is that um, we've got this ball lightning um, that we've, we've seen enough examples of that we know it's a thing that really happens. There's you know, observations all the way back through antiquity of, of this kind of thing. Um, but we don't have any good way to collect data on it because they're so rare. And, uh, you know, it's probably some sort of stable plasma that, you know, gets rolling around. And obviously it seems to live for long enough to, for people to be able to watch it move. But, you know, beyond that, uh, we don't, don't have a real good, uh, good handle on it. I don't know if this is a, if this is a legit picture of ball lightning, but I've certainly heard of it as well. And, um, you know, defined as a ball of plasma that just doesn't, it, it's, uh, it's, it's an elusive topic. You don't hear too much about, but is that, is that a legitimate picture or are there, is there, are there any legitimate pictures of real ball lightning? I'm not aware of any, this, this one's new to me. Um, you know, it, it would, uh, well, that's a that's a gift, but uh, well, we'll stop putting pictures up of, of uh, wannabe ball lightning. I'm not sure how to how to really attack that, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> interesting. Um, I did want to transition into um, some of the other factors that could be associated with lightning, such as the Earth's magnetic poles. Is there any correlation between uh, storm severity and, and convection and, and lightning with with our magnetics? Not really. Uh, the the Earth's Earth's magnetic field is uh, is relatively stable. Um, one of the things that the Earth's magnetic field does do for us, though, is it. Uh, we we were talking about the ionosphere before, and the the magnetic field of the Earth is one of the things that helps control um, can control the configuration of the ionosphere, um, and uh, that's actually a way you can detect lightning globally. Um, you can get the really, really big lightning strikes by using like maybe six sensors spread around the globe and lightning will actually, the signal from lightning will actually travel and bounce around between the, uh, the earth and the ionosphere and you can detect it at super long ranges that way. Uh, but uh, in terms of the, the, back, the background magnetic field of the earth, in and out, I, I don't think there's any real, real effect there. Okay. Is there any other questions from, from Eric? Did you have anything else? Um, I saw one of your, um, uh, on your bio describing some of the recent research that you've done into um, the, the maybe corroboration between lightning, lightning flashes and turbulence and thunderstorms. Um, what, what have you learned through, um, through some of the research you've, you've done on that? And, um, and where does that, where does that lead us from, um, you know, being able to tell that sort of thing. Yeah, I, well, one of the things that's really useful for is uh, if you can get a measure of the size of the lightning flashes, um, that helps you identify like the difference between a convective and a stratiform region. And um, if you if you have a pulse in the convection in a, in a thunderstorm, that will tend to lead to smaller flashes in up up high in the cloud as well. And so um, I think that the question is what's, what's causing that then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you look at a cloud, you're, you're used to seeing uh, that sort of cauliflower shape and uh, that cauliflower shape comes because it's a, it's a turbulent cloud and there's all sorts of stirring around going on in, in the updraft of the charge. 
And so for a really vigorous updraft, it's stirring around the charge so much that it breaks up those nice layers I showed you before um, into, uh, it, it sort of chops them up into all these little pockets. And there's so much charge being separated so fast uh, because there's so much ice uh, around up there that um, lots of flashes can happen um, that are very small and discharge those small little pockets of charge. So turbulence and combines with the microphysics and the, and the meteorology to lead to variations in the size of the charge pockets, which then leads to variations in flash sizes. And I would think that would have uh, also some uh, relation to, especially with the, the amount of mixing and so forth that's going on in that cloud, that that would have something to do with the severity of the, of the uh, storm as well. Yeah, that's right. That, uh, that idea is behind uh, one of the really nice pieces of work that, uh, that Chris Schultz at the University of Alabama Huntsville did for his PhD. He's now uh, at NASA Marshall in, in uh, Huntsville. And, uh, and uh, he came up with an algorithm called the lightning jump. And this is a, a really good way of quantifying sudden change to the mixed phase updraft in the storm. And if you think about how severe weather gets going, we know that the, the storm process is entirely driven, driven by the updraft. So let's say you have a, a pulse in that mixed phase updraft, that's gonna lead to um, maybe an increased likelihood of hail. Or if you get a, a big blob of precip that develops from that, maybe an increased likelihood of downburst winds. And so um, they were able to show that there's you know, decent, decent information there that uh, actually competes quite favorably with an automated algorithm from a radar. Um, humans always improve on that, but compared to an automated algorithm from a radar, it compares fairly favorably if you wanted to design something that would be a, a good severe weather predictor. Yeah, I think I'd seen uh, some research on that, that, that uh, those lightning jumps, a lot of times, not always, but they will um, kind of be the, the predecessor to uh, tornadoes that form as well. And they, a lot of times they can correlate that just before the tornado um, occurs that you see these jumps in the, in the lightning and, and trying to figure out how to operationally use that is, uh, is always a big question. That's right. And there's a really complex chain of, of processes from, you know, increasing the updraft to then what happens that actually gets the vorticity to spin up at the surface. And so, um, you know, if you have a, I think if the lightning jump is like a, a piece of the puzzle, you combine that with your understanding of how the storm works from the radar and from a lightning point of view, and maybe your sense of what the environment's like, you know, it's a favorable shear environment. Um, and you combine all that together and get a good, uh, it, it helps you increase your confidence in your warning that way. A lot of good research to be done in that area, I know. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of switch gears. I had a couple other questions before we approach, or I guess it's just about eight o'clock right now or yeah, eight o'clock central. So, um, I forgot to mention earlier before we got into all the physics that you previously were doing some, um, stadium work. So a big thing in my field is obviously lightning safety, uh, with people being outside at, at stadiums and things like that. Could you go into some of those roles and duties you did for uh, Texas Tech and football games? Yeah, right. Um, so that's been a, a real fun opportunity to uh, to work with the athletics uh, department here and provide uh, weather support for them on game days. Um, most days, as, as you know, it's, uh, it's pretty sunny here in Lubbock and you get a good sunburn during a football game. But um, we have had a couple cases where, um, you know, where a, where a stoppage was warranted uh, in the game. Uh, due to due to lightning overhead, and so we serve as a, a sort of expert um, experts in the in the booth up there, um, who can provide a, um, information on is there a, a cloud to ground strike within the radius uh, that the NCAA requires? You know, we we uh, clear the field. Um, is there severe weather approaching? And uh, uh, you know, we can work right there hand in hand with the folks that do the stadium messaging to ensure that the not only the teams but all the fans there stay safe as well. Do you think they've kind of grown more receptive to that safety thing or have they always been kind of erring on the side of caution when it comes to weather and uh, outdoor events? I, I think if you look around nationally, there's a, there's a, I think a growing awareness of this, uh, some sports more than others. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, one of the, one of the real challenges is that you're you're typically in a, a TV broadcast situation. There's you know all sorts of factors that um, you know people are already there in the stadium. They're ready to have a good time. There's a lot of pressures that say you know don't don't disrupt this good thing that we've got going on here. And so um, 
it's a thing where you know smart policy and um, you know empowering the the emergency managers and the the meteorology ex experts um, to to say no, you're in a dangerous situation might. Uh, I, I think it's really important in in providing some providing lead time uh, to ensure people are staying safe. Uh, there's been quite a few documented close calls um, that uh, I I would certainly like to see a, a stronger policy for. Um, you know, expert assessment coming into play. Definitely. I completely agree. I actually sat through a really cool presentation at our state conference last week, and I can't remember his name right now, which he would kill me, but he's actually a meteorologist that works for OU kind of as their like emergency that, uh, manager. Kevin Kleisel. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin, I've met him several times. Uh, he gives great presentations, but he did a ton of event planning stuff. And he was very harsh with a lot of the emergency managers in the room saying like, listen, like we have this data, it only takes one. Um, we're seeing a lot of late action where people are waiting until the lightning strike is literally a mile away before they're evacuating mm -hmm. and uh, doing all that kind of thing. So I think we're moving there. We just need a little more emphasis on uh, how, how close is too close. Because sometimes it seems like it's, it's a lot farther than it is, but it's not. Right, and if if you have someone that's that's really good about following the rules, they're going to see it has to be a cloud to ground strike within a certain distance. Now we have new data sets, um, you know, that weren't there 20 years ago that tell us we've got lightning in the cloud overhead, or we can, uh, you know, so we can we can see that. Um, and and even if there's no no ground strike, my recommendation would be, you know, we need to take action because that storm we don't know if it's going to throw throw a bolt down to the ground at any time now. So you know, we really want to respond to that. Um, more proactively, but the rules don't say any lightning, they say cloud to ground lightning. Mm -hmm. That actually leads uh, directly into a question that I was going to pose for you already. So one of my roles is uh, as, as a kind of a weather consultant to uh, several outdoor events here in, in the Memphis area. Um, one, in, in fact, it's, uh, that goes on this month um, where we have tens of thousands of people down on the riverfront for a, a giant festival all weekend. And, you know, if you're going to evacuate, there's really no good places to put people other than parking garages or back to their cars. Um, and one of the things I'm looking at, obviously, um, besides just the radar data is overlaying the lightning data and, you know, being able to see the in cloud versus the cloud to ground lightning. So given that, if there was, if there was say one or two um, main things that you'd be looking for to kind of be your predictor for that cloud to ground strike is, is in cloud lightning, the best thing to keep an eye on um, that, you know, indicates that that might occur, or is there something else that you're uh, looking at to keep, kind of give you that heads up that we really need to be watching this particular storm? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the in cloud lightning has been demonstrated to, to give you some lead time, um, you know, in a lot of situations, uh, in advance of the first cloud to ground strike. Um, so, so if you can get your hands on uh, in cloud lightning data, that's uh, that's a great thing to add to your to your toolkit. Um, you know, sometimes you're unlucky, and the first strike is uh, is a um, uh, is going to be a cloud to ground strike, and there you're going to want to be looking for like reflectivity getting high, uh, large reflectivity above the the melting level, so that you've uh, you you can see that that ice precipitation process is kicking in. Great advice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right. so, oh, oh, go ahead, Ashley. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say I have a follow up onto Eric's who followed up onto mine. So we're in a, a follow up section. Um, so I do a lot of event monitoring as well, especially for any city events. And it's in our plans, like he was saying. Um, and we've talked a lot on other shows about lightning resources, lightning data, because it's a big deal that we're finally getting lightning data that's coming out and it's new and it's, it's, it's really um, modern. Uh, do you have some good tips on some lightning data to look at? I know that I've been approached by some fire chiefs and stuff who want strike data, mm -hmm. but um, we're just not sure exactly uh, what's accurate, what's estimated, what's the best kind of data. So where could we go to get accurate data for event monitoring, like he was saying, and uh, strike data? Yeah, right. Um, so there's a, there's a variety of companies. There's um, there's three that I know of. Uh, Visal has been in the business the longest, and uh, Earth Networks also has a Lightning product now. And uh, there's a company called, uh, I believe, TOA Systems that also sells a. Uh, that's the USPLN data is the are the are the three for that. 
Um, those are the three that I'm aware of. Um, and then, and those, those are going to do the best at detecting the ground strikes. Um, a lot of them will also, uh, I've also started offering an in-cloud lightning product now as well. Um, that is uh, probably going to be lower detection efficiency in my estimation than the, than the geostationary lightning mapper data. But, um, uh, but all of those are, you know, useful pieces of information and they're all detecting slightly different parts of the, the lightning process as well. And so, um, you know, you can, uh, you can come, I, I would actually really recommend keeping a, a ground strike focus system as well as something that's more focused on the total lightning together because then you can, you can sort of partition that. Yeah, thank you so much. That's great advice. Um, I, I was really hoping to kind of compile data sets and have multiple ways to check because um, it's just, I guess it's just very dangerous to be outside at, at concerts and things like that. And it's a lot of responsibility for us. We want to make sure to get people. See you. And uh, I know that we're, we're past the nine o'clock hour, but uh, this one pertains directly to public safety as well. And, um, you know, when we talk about bolt out of the blue and um, the these these events, I've seen this on the coast a lot when you have the sea breeze front inland and you have the storms build up and then everyone thinks they're okay on the beach and all of a sudden a bolt 20, 30 miles out and over the ocean mm -hmm. and it just pops right over the ocean and everyone's looking at each other like, whoa, where did that come from? Because right overhead, it's sunny and, and that's why they call it bolt out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we had John Jensenius from NOAA, lightning expert, come on and he talked about some of the distances, but I think the distances of these bolts out of the blue far exceed some of the numbers that are out there now. And what, why does this occur and why does it pick some spot 40, 50 miles away from the thunderstorm to strike? And these also cause fatalities as well. Yeah, right. Um, you know, I, I think I would certainly trust the guidelines John, John gave you as a rule of thumb and I'm sure those are optimized against the false alarm to, you know, probability of detection balance that you're always walking with, uh, with a warning type thing. Uh, but, you know those those things out of out of the ocean. You know, 40, 50 miles. That's really, really quite a long distance. I'm not sure. Those might be a really extreme case of a bolt from the blue, or uh, you know, I, I wonder if there might be some sort of distant cloud deck that you know the the channel gets traveling a long distance like it would through a stratiform region, and uh, you know, and comes to ground. Some of those. You know, some of those stratiform discharges in a mesoscale convective system can span like a whole state. There was a really neat article about the, uh, like a world record lightning flash that was published uh, in one of the journals in the past year or two. Um, so those are, uh, you know, those flashes can travel a really long distance from the convective core if you've got a lot of charge sitting around. Right, yeah, I was talking about from where the cloud is inland to the ocean. So it, might, it may not be 40, I, I think I calculated on, uh, Radar Scope Pro one day, it was like 38 miles or something. And it was like, whoa, you yeah. know, just, just from where the, where the flash happened to where the closest thunderhead was. So, um, yeah, just something for the public, for, for viewers here to be on the guard for just because the storm isn't right over your head or within eye distance in one corner of the sky doesn't mean you still can't get hit by lightning from a distant storm. Um, I think that's going to wrap it up for the questions from, from the panelists. And, um, we certainly appreciate you coming on. Would you like to tell our viewers how we can find you and your information? Do you have a Twitter account or Facebook account? Anybody that, uh, or any way for folks to follow you? Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, I'm deeply cloudy on Twitter, and uh, you can find my ordinary faculty, uh, you know, type bio page at the Texas Tech Atmospheric Science uh, Group website. Um, if you uh, Google Eric Bruning. Texas Tech, I'm sure you'll get the get the right link that way. Um, so those are probably the two best ways to find me, I'd say. Okay, so yeah, this would be your Twitter account then. I was looking for you earlier, and uh, so this this is it for the Twitter. And so we, we'll be able to see a lot of information that you're posting about Lightning there, which is fantastic, because we can keep up with your studies and your research. So Absolutely. thank you very much for coming on. I think we're gonna, we're gonna skip Tweet of the Week because we are past the nine o'clock hour tonight, and uh, we'll go right to our show lineup for the next few weeks. I know next week we are empty. We don't have anything uh, really on tap. And let me see if I can find, I had it up earlier. Let's see here. Yes, yeah, so, yep, yeah, going for next week, we're wide open. So if any of the viewers out there have any ideas for guests for next week, uh, we'll always be on the hunt. We will come up with somebody, but any ideas that you have you want to convey to us, 
uh, feel free to, to let us know through our various uh, social media channels. Uh, as we go to June the 6th, we'll have Alan Seals. He's with WKRG Mobile, Alabama. He is the current president of the National Weather Association. So we're, we're excited to have him on to talk about all things weather and anything that is relevant to what he's doing for his job with the National Weather, I'm sorry, National Weather Association. And uh, so we'll go from there on June the 13th, we talk about earthquakes uh, with Kenneth Hudnut of USGS and he's out of San Francisco. So his study is gonna be specifically about the San Francisco area and the, and the San Andreas Fault with some of the activity going on over on the West Coast and how it relates to the East Coast. We'll get to some of that, not too much, but we'll, we'll ask him a few questions. Um, we also have Phil Klotz back coming on from Colorado State University on June the 20th to talk about the hurricane season preview. Uh, we'll be uh, into the hurricane season at that point, which starts June the 1st, but it's great to have someone of his caliber to come on our show to discuss the tropics as we head into what seems to be sort of an unknown hurricane season ahead. We're thinking average. It could be a little bit below average. We're not really sure. We're in our final La Nina watch. We're going to be going into a Nino uh, neutral phase through the summer and probably going to stay that way for some time watching to see what happens there. Uh, and then we have Warren Causey coming on June the 27th to talk about his sirens project, which they launched drones into supercells and tornadoes to get information. So if you think about the movie Twister and they had Dorothy with all the little sensors that went up in the air while well, these guys are doing it for real with drones and uh, they're, they're getting some very valuable information. So we'll see uh, what they have to say. And I think with that, does anybody have anything else to add to the show? No, I just want to thank Dr. Bruning for coming on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Very Welcome good. My pleasure. All right. And with that, we'll end the Carolina Weather Group. Join us next week at 8.15 Eastern Time, actually 7.15 Central Time, uh, for our next show. And we'll have a surprise guest, and uh, we'll go from there. Until next week, everybody take care. Have a good night.